Okay, so let's get started. Today we're going to do a uh, overview of the IFS cloud service. And again, my name is Bob Corrigan. I'm the Vice President of the Established Accounts Team and I'll be going through this presentation. So what we're going to be talking about today is the IFS cloud services. Uh, IFS does provide flexible deployment options. Everything that I'm going to be talking about in the beginning applies to both applications 10 or IFS cloud versions. Um, so when you see IFS cloud services, it is synonymous with uh, what IFS is also referred to as IFS managed cloud. This is the options that we're going to be talking about here and whether or not you're going to deploy that, you know, on premise or in a third party hosted type of environment. So that's what um, the today's session is going to go over. So IFS does provide our customers with choice. This is something that most of our competitors no longer do uh, provide customers with. And it gives you the ability to uh, decide that you do not need to have cloud services. So I know with the naming of the latest version of our product to IFS Cloud, uh, that has created some confusion. Um, but IFS Cloud services are not required. You can still run them on-premise. You can put them in a third-party hosted data center. Uh, none of those uh, are, are an issue for us. And also, uh, there is not a requirement for you to be on a subscription license model. So, you know, uh, existing customers can continue to, you know, be on a perpetual license mod model with uh, maintenance. So this just kind of shows you that regardless if you're on perpetual or subscription, you can be on site, you know, on premise, as it's sometimes referred to, uh, third party hosted, meaning it's in, you know, either your own Azure subscription or uh, AWS or, you know, some other hosting center, or you can subscribe to the IFS cloud services. So what exactly um, are cloud services? So this gives you a little representation of the uh, major components that have to be, you know, acquired, maintained, uh, and managed if you're going to be doing the various models. So on the left, we'll just kind of start with, you know, on-premise or on-site. You know, that means that you have your own servers, your own storage devices, your own network configuration to support that. Uh, maybe you have the virtualization software to run VMs on top of those uh, servers and hardwares. Of course, then you have an operating system to administer and patch, a database to administer and patch, you know, middleware to administer and patch. Uh, in the case of IFS, the uh, IFS middleware, you have the various runtimes, you have to monitor your environment, you have to do the backups, you have to monitor the application, you have to do the installation um, of any patches or, or updates to the offer, uh, software, and of course then you have to control your data. Uh, if you go into a customer cloud type of environment, this typically means that, you know, you have the servers and storage and network, you know, virtualized, and you're just pretty much administering, you know, what's in the darker uh, blue here. And then if you do go with a, a true hosting provider, uh, a hosting provider will typically handle all of the things below you know, they'll take care of your operating system. They may or may not take care of the database and middleware. Uh, it depends a lot on, on the hosting configuration. Um, and then you have to administer and manage the, the top portion here. If you go with IFS Cloud Services, IFS does everything for you, including the installation of um, updates, patches, monitoring. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, when you get into the cloud version, the build place administration. Uh, so all you have to do is manage your data. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So IFS Cloud Services, what's included? So it includes all of the server side technical infrastructure needed to run IFS. That's all the servers, all the storage, the operating systems, database, middleware servers, uh, all those things that are needed and all the management services to operate it. Um, we'll talk a moment about what you're still responsible for as a customer. Uh, IFS, you know, our solution is um, accessed, you know, some method from a remote location. So that can either be through the public internet, 
Uh, it can be on a site-to-site -site VPN, which is the most common that we uh, utilize with our customers. And then, of course, uh, depending upon the size of your um, organization and you know your security requirements, you may actually want to have an express route, which is your own private network, uh, typically on a third-party um, telephone telecom communication provider to the actual data center uh, where your system will be re residing. And then, of course, security is, you know, paramount, you know, now to any business system, given the environment that we're in with ransomware, et cetera. Uh, so all data is encrypted, whether it's at rest and in transit. Um, one of the unique things about IFS is our environments are single tenant. So this provides, you know, a single tenant architecture. This really makes sure there's true segregation and isolation from other customer environments. Um, we do the virus and malware protection. We do the denial of service detection and protection. And then, of course, we can perform the multi-level backups, including geographically separate backup storage sites. This will give you a little idea of, you know, a, a kind of a, <coughs> a visual of how, you know, you're connected to the on-premise infrastructure. And, you know, when we get into the on-premise infrastructure, that's one of the things that's still the responsibility of our customer. Um, and so we're really handling everything up here, um, but you still have responsibility for the PCs, the print agents, and I'll kind of go through this in a moment. But this just gives you an idea of a typical configuration using, you know, VPN tunneling um, to, you know, connect both IFS support organization or your partner that you're using, uh, as well as your end users that are not on your local WAN, um, you know, in maybe a building complex. So what are you responsible for? You know, you are responsible, even if you have the IFS cloud services, you are still the, uh, you have to provision, configure, and manage the customer network connectivity up to uh, the Azure Data Center. So this would include your internet connectivity, include the on-site routers that you're using, uh, the PCs and any other devices that you might be configuring. Uh, as it says, the next one is if you have um, tablets, phone devices, um, uh, if you have remote print agents, those are uh, your responsibility to still manage those. Uh, as well as, you know, when you dispatch cases to IFS, you know, you want to make sure you have all the detail we have in them. And then when it comes down to managing the data in your system, you're still using the standard um, administration tools within IFS. You're still responsible for creating and managing the user accounts, the profiles, um, the user experience configuration. If you're going to, you know, create base profiles and set out configurations, custom fields, custom menus, etc., uh, you have the responsibility for the security of your system on the user side. Uh, so, you know, this would include roles, permission sets, um, and things to, you know, control your user access. Uh, configuring the administration functions, such as you're going to turn on history logging and monitor that. Um, making sure your background uh, jobs and scheduled tasks are configured and managed. Any quick reports that you're going to be providing. Uh, any... Um, custom events or custom event actions, uh, report management and print uh, management configuration, and then all the processes and data that's stored and processed within the system like document management documents, et cetera. So the key benefits of the IFS cloud service is it is an outcome-based service. It does have a service level agreement that is supported by contract penalties. Uh, you are running, uh, IFS runs all of our cloud services environments in the Microsoft Azure um, public cloud platform. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, ITAR here in a moment. But it does give you, you know, rapid access to highly scalable infra infrastructure. You can see one of their data centers in the little picture on the right. Uh, options to integrate with on-premise IT uh, estate. So for, you know, kind of a hybrid cloud solution. Uh, it does provide very strong security. Um, you know, the Azure environments are, are um, super uh, secure physically and, um, you know, from the Internet. Uh, very robust platforms. And, you know, it does give you continuous benefit from the latest technologies as, you know, Microsoft is investing literally billions of dollars in their uh, buildup of this uh, cloud infrastructure around the world. It does give you flexibility. You, as I said, unlike some of our competitors, you can run either a perpetual or subscription licensed software 
uh, on the IFS cloud services. Uh, the complexity is greatly reduced as opposed to working with a third party hosting type of environment or even working with, you know, the maintenance of on premise hardware and uh, service technicians that have to maintain that. All that complexity is taken out um, and, and given to IFS to handle. Uh, reduce reliance on your specialized in-house skills and resources so that they can focus on, you know, true business initiatives, not doing the mundane, I don't want to say mundane, but the, the routine task of, you know, monitoring a system, responding when there's an issue with a RAID data set, making sure the backups are being completed, uh, all the, the things that have to take place, those are specialized skills. Uh, so you have to have trained people. You have to, you know, keep their skills current and updated. Uh, and, you know, sometimes, you know, it's advantageous to, you know, have that as part of what you're uh, getting from IFS cloud services. And then, of course, these services are provided by IFS. Uh, these are IFS employees that are doing this work around the world. Uh, so, you know, it gives you, the uh, customer, the chance to have, you know, what some people refer to as a single uh, throat to choke uh, as the responsible party for the software, the support, uh, consulting service operations, you know, that's, um, it, it really simplifies things. So it is based on a monthly fee. That monthly fee varies depending upon, you know, the number of users, the database size, <coughs> the con connectivity um, methods that you want to have. But all the things that are included in a monthly fees are all the servers, storage, operating system, the services to manage the technical environment, to manage the platform, making sure that we're, you know, managing and patching, you know, Microsoft and, and Oracle. We are managing the applications, <clears throat> so if you have, um, and I'll talk a little bit about some additional application managed services you can subscribe to uh, if you don't want to do some of them yourself or if you want to do those actually, we can offer this uh, for customers that are on-premise, not in our managed cloud service. And then we do have, you know, backup with disaster recovery options. Uh, we have pre-configured uh, configurations to, you know, make it fast to deploy these and minimize costs. A very secure uh, environment when we do integrations. And the installation of any deliveries that would include updates, um, for apps 10, for the cloud version, there are service updates monthly, there are release updates twice a year. So it gives you all of that secure, trusted, reliable, 24 by 7, 365 days a year with service level agreements all in one contract. So those are some of the advantages of the cloud services. If your company is subject to the ITAR um, international traffic and arms export control requirements. You know, you're also responsible for the operational compliance of any cloud-based services that you use. Uh, so IFS offers an optional enhanced uh, control services for our cloud services that enable uh, any company that has to have compliance with ITAR. And those cloud services uh, have both operational and physical isolation. Uh, so we do use the Microsoft Azure Gov Cloud or Government Cloud Platform. This is a sovereign U.S. cloud trusted by the federal, state, and local governments um, in the United States. Uh, it is physically isolated U.S. data centers and the networks. Uh, they are operated by screened U.S. persons. And, of course, it gives you the opportunity to meet the highest level of security and regulatory compliance that uh, you might be uh, under consideration for. Also, IFS, uh, our cloud services team that's um, you know managing behind the scenes, uh, they are all dedicated uh, for the ITAR operations. Um, we do have internal specific control measures like the export control policies and export control procedures and technical control plans. All of our people are ITAR trained and aware. Uh, we do do quarterly internal reviews and audits to assess and mitigate any kind of operational risk. And we do restrict all staff access to our customer environments to only eligible uh, U.S. persons. So some of the things that are available um, in the ITAR environment. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the changes since the IFS cloud version uh, has been released back in March and we're getting ready to release the uh, second the release update 2 will be coming out here at the end of October of uh, 2021 and there were some changes in the uh, architecture and I want to just make sure because they do affect some of the hosting requirements <coughs> and the managed cloud uh, services ability. So one of the changes, we have eliminated um, any of the clients other than what's now the arena clients. Uh, so some of you that are on older versions would have had the IFS Enterprise Explorer client. Uh, even older, you'd have been on the Centura client. All of those clients have been um, obsoleted and deprecated. They're not available. And everything is now on the arena, which is a web browser-based access to the system and uh, that is inclusive even of some of our mobile solutions that we have the native apps even though they can run offline uh, they still use the the browser and a local uh, database on the device for when they're offline um, typically you can access it through any of the uh, browsers uh, and you know those are the arena client only the middle tier has been moved to a container and that container, you know, uh, Kubernetes cluster with Docker, you know, some technical terms using these RESTful OData uh, protocols. Uh, this replaced what was the IFS middleware that relied on Oracle WebLogic. So the Oracle WebLogic is no longer in our uh, middle tier. Uh, we've gone to this container to simplify deployment and patching and security. Uh, we still do use the Oracle database. Um, so when you move into the later versions of 10, even uh, apps 9, if you're on, you know, update 16 or later, uh, and all of the cloud version would be on 19C. And then typically the platforms that we're seeing deployed, you know, our Windows Server uh, or Azure, you know, we do see people have their own Azure subscriptions that are utilizing those. And of course, you know, the various Linuxes that are out there. So one of the things that's been introduced with the cloud version is the life cycle experience. And this was um, introduced to put the customer in control. And, you know, what exactly does that mean? So it means that uh, IFS um, has a master repository. And, you know, we are responsible for publishing, you know, new releases, service updates, um, and then making those available to our customers through what's called a build place. And the build place is part of the lifecycle experience portal. I'll go into this in a little more detail. But it means that you as a customer own everything um, related to who can access and support your environment, even IFS. You have to enable IFS to be able to come in and do support work or consulting or any type of work on your environment by granting us access through your build place. So you are in control. Uh, you control who the IFS people are that are enabled as well as who the partners are that are enabled. So the term you'll want to become familiar with is lifecycle experience portal. It is where the build place is housed. And this is where you get to choose a solution set. You get to do any tailoring, um, testing, delivery. Um, and, and there's things called pipelines and uh, development and QA environments. Uh, you do have complete access to the IFS developer tools now. I'll go through that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, you have a fully integrated support portal. Um, and then you have what's called a use place. And a use place is uh, another term. You're going to start to hear a lot of places, build place, use place. I'll talk even about the upgrade place and demo place. Um, but this is where your production environment and um, your user acceptance testing environments are, are housed. And we do offer two different choices. Every customer that's on the cloud version gets a lifecycle experience portal that includes the build place, the support portal, the developer tools. Uh, all of this is here. It's just you can decide to deploy it in the IFS cloud service, or you can deploy it what we call remote. That could be sometimes interchangeable on-premise, but remote can mean you know anything. Um, 
you know, on, on premise typically means you've got your own servers on your own site. Um, but, you know, we know many of those people have those in hosting centers. So the architecture of the lifecycle um, support architecture. So <clears throat> IFS globally has a master release repository, artifact repository, um, and artifact storage. And that information, it uses a, um, a, a term called Git. You know, it's a develop, it's a DevOps, a development ops uh, tool set that's part of uh, the Azure build place that we provide. And that is then um, available for you in your build place under what's called the customer solution repository. That is where you actually, you know, get the information, the updates. I'll talk a little bit about, you know, um, uh, updates in a moment, but that is where you create your development and your quality assurance environments, not your dev, not your production environments. And then there's uh, pipelines. These are terms you're going to um, become familiar with when you go through some of the training, uh, some test automation and more uh, that are delivered in the build place. And then, you know, f using that lifecycle experience portal is how you administer it and hold it all together. Uh, this creates, you know, what we'll call a delivery. Um, it's, it's more broad than a delivery. And then you have what's called the use place. So the use place is where the actual system will reside. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the use place can either be in the IFS cloud services or it can be remote or on-premise. And, you know, we deploy the Kubernetes clusters, you know, the namespace, the, the database, and, you know, you can have multiple environments. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. So, you know, the, the life cycle experience, you know, has several processes. And this is how we are going to allow customers, partners, and IFS to work together. So customers choose who has access to their uh, build place. So the first thing that happens, there's a user management form that gets completed. There is a build place administrator in your organization or two. Um, and then they are responsible for actually enabling any implementation partners or people that you're going to have access at, um, or even IFS consulting and support services have to be granted access um, to be able to access and, and use your build place. So then customers, now you can develop your own configurations and, you know, we've continued to expand configuration capabilities within the application. Uh, and, you know, you could even uh, potentially do some customization if you needed to. So this is where there's configuration um, environment, there's solution management, um, and then, you know, this kind of gives you the idea of, you know, how you're going to do development. You know, if you're going to use a third party, you know, uh, external partner, you know, how they can uh, come in and uh, assist in that, you know, and then how you can make sure that uh, those are imported into your use place. And, you know, so it just gives you that whole uh, capability of, you know, managing the cycle for configuration and co customizations. And then you can also take updates. So one of the changes in the cloud version, you know, in applications 10, uh, we do quarterly updates and those include, you know, the bug fixes and some enhancements. Um, whereas in the cloud version, we do a monthly service update that includes SEV1, SEV2 patches, uh, so they can get to you very fast. And then um, every six months, we do what's called a, uh, um, a release update. And that release update um, is very similar to what you're doing in, uh, in apps 9 and 10 for the update. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the additional tools that have been added. But those are all available in the Lifecycle Experience now to you as a customer. Or if you select for IFS to do that work for you. Or you can select an IFS business partner to do that work for you. So the Lifecycle Experience, just a kind of uh, another graphic to look at it that might be easier to understand. Um, <clears throat> the, the portal has uh, the ad customer administrator people that grant access to this um, uh, build place and lifecycle experience to their own uh, employees. You have developers, testers, you know, technicians that would be involved. There is a developer portal, and I'll go through that a little bit more here in a moment. Uh, as I said, IFS creates these master code repositories, and you have to create your own pipelines and branches uh, off of those. 
Uh, using this Azure DevOps services is where you do the actual configuration of the baseline repositories, um, build your pipelines. Uh, it also has, you know, the, some delivery artifacts um, that you have using this uh, JFrog um, artifactory. And then you would end up creating your test and dev uh, build place environments. And then you would take those out into what's called the use place. You can do that in IFS cloud services or remote. And typically out of the box, you're going to get a prod, uh, a user acceptance test, and a configuration environment um, that are available. So taking a little look at the actual lifecycle experience portal, um, when you log in, you can see here's the different options available to manage your solution. You know, different, you know, jobs, storage, uh, you can order additional deliveries, order a new environment, you know, do some sanity builds, apply those service updates on a monthly, determine which languages you're going to deploy. Uh, it shows you where your database repository is, your solution repository, um, how to configure your VPNs, you know, more details on your, on your build place information. So this is what the um, portal looks like. And then from that portal, you have access to um, several other um, important sites to go to. So just to kind of take a look at some of these. So one would be the uh, developer portal. So I did mention a developer portal. It's open to you right now publicly. Uh, so it's developer.ifs.com. And this is where you can see all the developer tools that are available for, you know, things like lobby analyzer, configuration analyzer, update analyzer, uh, all the documentation for the IFS Cloud and Applications 10 are both there, including the information regarding the lifecycle experience. Um, several infos on, you know, different references that are available to you. And, you know, you can kind of, um, you know, navigate this. But everybody will have access to this type of environment. And, you know, you would want to kind of go to the lifecycle experience documentation. You know, and it'd take you in how do you get started? What's a build place deliverable? How do you order them? So you definitely are going to want to go through those. Um, the other thing that was mentioned there is all technical documentation. Uh, again, that is currently available to you um, publicly. So it's on docs.ifs.com. Uh, and, you know, there you can find the cloud documentation. You can find uh, technical documentation. Uh, also, one of the things that's useful there is the Arena User Guide. Um, so there's another webcast that shows you how to actually uh, provide this to your users so that they can, you know, familiarize themselves with Arena and walk through, you know, the Arena and, you know, how to use it and work within those spaces. Um, also, there is the Academy site, uh, the Community site, and the Support Portal. All of these have additional webcasts, detailed webcast on the Academy, detailed webcast on the Community, um, are all available on the, the same site that you were at uh, today to get to this one. Uh, IFS does offer the two deployment models that I mentioned. You know, the first choice we typically recommend to everyone is use IFS cloud services. And, you know, this provides us, you're, you're getting the cloud as a service. Um, but we still do, you know, and can fully provide uh, remote on-premise. You know, this is a prepackaged virtual appliance um, that you can use in conjunction with the database and the platform and software uh, for your choice of residency. And, you know, the version deployment, you know, again, as I said, the cloud service is, you know, very much like IFS providing software as a service. We don't really call it SaaS because, you know, you can have perpetual or subscription licensing. Um, so we're really, you know, we try to differentiate ourselves from our competition by still providing those choices. But, you know, sometimes there's only so many words and we decide to call this uh, cloud service. This one we call remote, um, and that just means it's not in our managed cloud environments. It's not in our cloud um, place, but you still have everything. Um, you still have a build place, and then you decide how do you want to support it in your environment using a standard virtual machine. Uh, if you have a requirement to be air-gapped from the Internet, uh, you know, those would be companies that are, you know, controlled maybe by Homeland Security and others. And then Ubuntu, um, which is this open source operating system on Linux, uh, is another option that IFS provides for how you can potentially deploy this. 
the the build place uh, you know it's one of the steps in this life cycle experience and within there the goal is to implement end-to-end -end dev app devops and as i said this is where you take software development and it operations and the goal is to shorten the time it takes to deploy new releases to deploy updates and patches to releases uh, and then of course you know continue to configure um, the software and you know generate reports integrations you know and if needed modifications uh, the biggest thing is to make sure now that everyone understands the, the customers um, have control and ownership of the build place. And, you know, what is in the build place? As I said, this is, you know, IFS source code. It's the only way to deploy IFS cloud version. So with IFS cloud version, there is no other method than to go through a build place. Um, state-of-the-art code management, you know, updates, releases, you can add customizations, you know, you know, many of you may have relied heavily on IFS to do, you know, customizations, modifications in the past, but, you know, those are now in your control as a customer, um, the ability to do unit testing, controlling your own deliveries, so a lot of the, um, work that had been done in the past and caused some delays and, and uh, miscommunications, you know, those are all now right directly in uh, our customers' hands. And, you know, I will say there is a developer workstation. Uh, again, there will be training that would be needed, you know, to be able to use that, but, you know, to be able to do customization. Uh, a lot of our partners have experience with these and, you know, can help you. Uh, as can IFS, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the services we offer to do that. Um, and then in that build place is where all these repositories are, the master repository, the customer solution repository, the service updates, and then what we call feature releases, which are, you know, each um, a release update. And um, there's two environments there, two dev environments by default, and they can be used um, for your non-productive uh, use place. They're called config and UAT, uh, user acceptance test right out of box. Uh, and then of course a prod environment. So that's typically the way it's configured. Um, and you know, who uses this? You know, as I said, the customer build place administrator, uh, they are the one that controls who has access. So they grant and revoke access. Uh, they assign authorization for all users, whether those are IFS employees, partner employees, or your own employees. Um, you have in the building section, you have you know, either solution developers or technicians, um, which can you know, pull the service updates and releases, look at the update analyzer, handle any issues, make any customizations and modifications that are needed, uh, order any of the new on-demand environments that are needed. Uh, you have the solution consultants that are doing the testing of the updates and our mods. They create the update deployment from the master branch, and then the solution consultant would trigger the uh, delivery getting deployed into the use place. So unlike, you know, I'll say previous build places, and previous build places means, you know, what IFS controlled all of this in our harvest environments. Some of you will recognize that term. Um, and, you know, that was always provided through IFS, hosted in our um, networks, hosted on our environments. And, you know, that did cause a lot of um, uh, issues with giving access to customers to those, you know, builds beforehand uh, and giving access to partners. So by moving to the cloud build place, one shared environment, and that's what everyone's using, support, consulting, partners, customers, uh, and you as the customer govern it. So this is a somewhat change. It doesn't affect anything to the, to the end user. I mean, the software still runs exactly the same, looks exactly the same um, as if you had it on premise or you didn't have it in a cloud build place. But this is a, a, a move that uh, IFS has made. So just another picture to kind of show you the build place. You know, so you can go to the build place. Once you're there, you can find out a lot of information related to it. Um, you know, sysadmin passwords and things like that are controlled, you know, at this level. And you can um, obviously order additional environments called branches and decide where you want those to go. Uh, you can order deliveries and decide, you know, where those deliveries go with a target commit branch. 
So there is some new wording and verbiage. Um, some of your system admin people may not be familiar with this because in the past this was typically performed by um, IFS or uh, in some cases by some of our partners, but now it will be um, in your control. You can still contract to IFS or to partners uh, to help you manage that. So just a, a couple of simple graphics here. So if you are using the IFS cloud service, how does it work? So it, it's pretty easy. <laughs> IFS does everything. So you have your um, build place and you know all the delivery and updates and things for your config and acceptance tests and prod environments in the use place, which is in Azure, are all done in this nice little box by IFS. If you're going to do remote or on-premise, uh, there are some things that change. And, you know, really what it is, everything stays the same in how the source code is grabbed and merged and built and how the deliveries are made. Um, but there is a container um, that is a prepackaged image, a VM image, uh, that you have to run on your site. So you do need a management server. That's a small Windows-based server uh, to manage those packages. Um, and that would be, a, a we, we ship it as a Linux VM. Um, we recommend VMware, but we do support, I'll show you in a moment, um, the other configuration. And then, you know, everything else is uh, in what's called your use place. So there is the movement of the data um, into your uh, environment and then uh, running it. If uh, you do use Ubuntu, I never am great at the uh, <laughs> wording on that, but that does give you another option in the way that's managed. You still have to have that management server, but it uh, eliminates some of the uh, requirements for VMware. One of the things I want to make sure people are aware of is that the build place is provided you know, as part of your maintenance agreement on the IFS cloud version. So there is no other additional charges, but it only provides um, two standard environments besides prod, which are the UAT and, and config, and it allows for up to 15 users to access it. If for some reason you need more than, you know, the, the two um, environments, you know, you may need to order some additional in, in increments of two. You can have up to six so, and I'll talk a moment about upgrade and, you know, maybe you have a major mod that you want to test completely separate or you want to do integration or you want to do training. Um, so you can order additional environments um, if you're using the IFS uh, environments. And, but even in the build place to have more than just the UAT and, and config. Uh, and then some projects, you may have a large number of people that have to access uh, your build place. Uh, typically, as I said, those are the administrators, the technical people that are configuring the deliveries and, and uh, conf customizations. Uh, if you need more, those are um, also licensed in groups of five. In uh, Cloud Update 2, or Release 2, um, which is being released October 29th of, uh, you know, coming up here in a couple of weeks. Uh, so this is for customers that are running, you know, Cloud 21R1. Um, there is in the life cycle experience, uh, you run the impact assessment and then you request the update. Uh, you'll grab the update. So it'd be update, you know, R2, release two. Uh, there's another impact analysis that you run and then it will uh, start to create, you know, a new uh, leg for you for your build place and then into your use place to do your testing. Um, so this is something that's new. But the, the biggest change is the introduction of what's called the Release Update Studio. So those of you that have already been uh, utilizing the build places in the lifecycle experience, um, you'll notice there's a new um, button that gets added, which is, you know, releases available. Uh, that'll light up, you know, sometime at the end of October, early November. Uh, and then the steps to, you know, go through taking that update, you know, looking at the impact assessment, the impact analysis, you know, order an environment, do a sanity build, and then order it for delivery. Uh, and it'll give you the various, um, you know, release update statuses as you move through. You've done the impact, you initialize that, you've completed the uh, uh, release update, you've, you know, didn't do the uh, impact analysis, order the baseline in progress. Um, so those are the things that are just introduce new. 
One of the things that we also want to make sure you're aware of is that IFS is um, added additional capabilities to, to what we call success services. Uh, also, you know, customers on our IFS cloud services are at our platinum support level. Um, so, you know, we're really saying to set the baseline, you should be on platinum support, which is 24 by 7, 365. And IFS cloud services kind of sets the foundation. So this purple block for platinum support and then the cloud service. We have um, optionally what's called the application management services as part of our success offering, which then allows you to um, select this. You do not need to have IFS cloud service and you do not need to be on platinum support. You could be on gold support. You can still subscribe to our application made services. And many customers are taking advantage of that if they have a transition from you know version to version. They don't have people they want to train on doing some of those technical pieces. All the things that we just talked about in administering and managing the build place and applying the deliveries. Um, if you're on premise, you know you can uh, subscribe to that type of service. And just a, a little view, everyone that um, gets, you know, what we call enabled success. And, you know, those are through the follow the sun responsiveness on gold, support services, uh, and then access to the IFS community. Uh, and then, you know, if you have platinum, it goes to 24 by 7. You get priority case queuing. Uh, you get a full service level agreement. You get customer care advocacy to, to manage and promote your uh, cases uh, throughout the organization. And then you get proactive update planning and application. So those are the things that are there. And, and then as we look at more of the in-depth success, you know, as we looked at a traditional uh, customer drift, you know, if you start with, you know, a version, maybe you started with version 9, and, you know, now we're on cloud 21 R2, um, you know, so IFS is moving and trying to keep pace or in many cases stay just ahead of the various industries. Um, and, you know, so we're adding new feature functionality, uh, security, um, all the things that are in the application to stay in sync with the uh, industry. The farther a customer falls behind in being able to stay in that evergreen track, the, you know, the more there is this gap. Um, and, you know, if you look at things like the IFS customer success plan, you know, that lets us really side-by-side -side plan, you know, do uh, continuous improvement. You know, there is a uh, subscription-based quarterly services, um, you know, advanced services, application analysis, technical analysis, um, optimization of usage so that we can keep you, you know, right in sync with the versions that we're releasing and what the industry demand is. And those are uh, typically delivered under what's called a tailored success plan. We do have specific ones related to upgrade readiness or re-implementation support services to, you know, help guide to, you know, what should you take advantage of, how should you take advantage of it, what training is needed. Uh, all those things are in that area. Um, we do some um, business value planning, collaboration. You know, you have a customer success manager assigned to you. We have these expert advisory services around, you know, support for implementation, upgrades, the technical architecture, um, solution management, um, managing any enhancements, and, you know, kind of, kind of always analyzing, you know, what's the next improvement you might want to take uh, advantage of. You know, in the latest version, we have a complete you know, cash management module now that's been introduced. You know, how could you take advantage of that? Uh, and then training and enablement services, including the self-paced learning and academy content and training. And then, as I mentioned, these application management services, which are, you know, typically, maybe you don't want to have someone in your organization writing custom fields or custom events or, uh, you know, ch doing screen configuration, you know, lobby uh, setups, you can um, have that as part of this guided, uh, tailored success. So um, I just wanted to bring a couple of other things up that have changed here in the last year. Uh, one is that IFS can no longer have copies of our customer databases inside of our environments. Um, and this means that any system needs to have an upgrade. Uh, you know, any server, storage, network access must be provided by the customer. Um, in the past, typically IFS had servers that we would run the upgrade scripts on. 
Um, we currently are not doing that. Uh, we are in the process of creating what's called an upgrade place. So you heard the term use place. Um, now there'll be an upgrade place. And this is another instance in the cloud service that could be used for running the upgrade scripts, you know, doing configuration and testing of an upgrade. And, you know, there'll be more information on the upgrade place. Otherwise, the biggest thing is to be aware that when you are doing an upgrade, you have to uh, provision the actual uh, equipment to do the upgrade uh, yourself or um, subscribe to that through IFS cloud services. Um, the other thing that's changed is for many years, IFS has provided what's called the product preview environment. Um, it is often known as RACE because it's been called RACE since 2000. Uh, that just means it's a database that's pre-populated with companies and suppliers and parts um, where you can run various scenarios through it. Um, they were built on race car drivers and parts and things. That's why it was called RACE at the time. Um, but it's been called the product preview environment and that is no longer um, provided. You know, it has been something that we provided, you know, 90 day um, Azure access to uh, people to preview the environment and to do some um, work. Uh, we are now looking at offering what's called a demo place. Again, upgrade place, use place, demo place, which would be another instance in the IFS cloud service. Uh, and it would be a version of IFS that's configured with data similar to race. Uh, and you could use it for familiarization with the new version, you know, perform maybe some initial training, uh, do some scenario testing, uh, which are the primary uses that we saw for uh, race and the product preview environments. So those are just a few changes. More information is available from myself or uh, your account, IFS account manager. So with that, I'm going to uh, close down this session and we'll move over to some questions.